Welcome everyone to this month's Insight Jam, how to create hit data products in an AI world. Let me start by focusing on the word hit. Um, uh, I just recently, my wife and I went to the uh, Stones concert here in Silicon Valley. Oh my gosh, it was fabulous. Right from the first song, Start Me Up, iconically, uh, to the last encore, Satisfaction. I mean, it was hit after hit after hit. What a blast. Um, even in their seventh decade, Nick, Keith, the rest of the band, they're just bringing it. And I was thinking about, you know, what, what makes a hit? And what makes, you know, a band so memorable? I mean, of course, it's, it's, it's the musicality, it's the uh, showmanship, the memorable lyrics, um, all those things. But the main thing is, is their songs are just and and valued by their audiences, and and not just when they originally came out. Like Satisfaction was in the '60s, and Star Me Up. I mean, that's an anthem from college years. I won't say what year that was, um, but these things were really continuously loved, and they're continued to be played. Dodge Ram commercials. I mean, it's crazy. Um, how iconic and how long lasting these songs are. I mean, what, what is it that makes them valuable? And, and so I thought about hits and then hit the, and trying to make the parallel to this, this, this seminar uh, on, on data products and how data products, don't we want them to be valued by the audience? Don't we want, you know, whether they are used in an analytic application internally or in driving AI um, models or in optimizing a business process. You want them to be used as a hit. They need to be used over and over again. And, and externally, whether this you know, is monetized or to help make a product more uh, diff differentiate a, a product with the data element inside, um, it's valuable and could drive revenues and, and reduce costs and optimize uh, processes and meet compliance needs. So there's all kinds of value that can come from these data services, especially if it's a hit and people use it and enjoy it. And so let's kind of use that uh, model or that that point of view um, to help you create hit data products in your organization. So we brought together three rock stars uh, and uh, I want to welcome them today. We got um, Mike Mogelski, who is the uh, CEO and founder of InfoB. Hey, Mike. Uh, Sharad Kumar, data integration lead for the Americas at Click. Everybody knows Click. Casey Lai, CEO and uh, founder at Prometheum. Welcome, gentlemen. Um, let's help the audience get to know you. Let's start with you, Mike. Um, tell us about yourself, your organization, and, and what you do there. Well, it's, yeah, thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here today. When, if you go back about a half a dozen years ago, I was working at a major semiconductor company and we had this, this issue where everybody was building their own silos, building their own versions of the truth. And we needed to centralize that. We called it the global data warehouse. The data warehouse term was still cool then. Um, but it, it really was a, a predecessor of the data lake and we created components, we call them Legos, that could be used to put together solutions, data-centric solutions for, for our business. First, uh, that happened to be a semiconductor company. About uh, after a couple of years of that, we went on a speaking tour, tour talking about that, that, um, that evolution, I will call it. You know, we were learning, but we were learning quickly. And um, out of that came a demand in the industry for more of that. And so Infovia started uh, in 2018 as a way, a via, a highway, a super highway, if you will, for your information to be delivered. And we're really about methodology and best practices and helping organizations do more with less, uh, primarily using automation to build these data products. Great. Um, thanks for that introduction. Look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say. Gerard, tell us uh, tell us about you and uh, Click and what you do there. Yeah, sure thing, Bob. Yeah, so my role at Click, I'm the field CTO for our data 
integration business. So we have two parts of the business at Click, the data integration side and, and the analytics side of the business. So I'm the field CTO on the data side of the business. So my background is I'm really a practitioner at heart. So all my life I've been in consulting and services. My latest role, I was the CTO of data and at Accenture. So I've worked with some of the largest data-driven customers out there. And I've seen this progression where we used to do data as a project, I call. Every project, you spin up everything you do. And then, like Mike was saying, we start moving toward these centralized warehouses and lakes. And what we found with some of the data, most data-driven customers, that still didn't solve the problem. Just centralizing the data one place wasn't solving the consumption problem. So mm -hmm. when I Accenture actually started a software company called Mosaic Data, where I set out to build a platform to enable data product managers to create these data products, which are kind of the bridge between producers and consumers. So last year that company was acquired by Click. So I came over to Click. So that's my current role. So I'm extremely passionate about data products. I've been practicing even with Accenture early stages of it with some advanced customers, then building my own. And now so I'm very passionate about, about the subject. And I, I think it truly delivers value into an enterprise. Well, wow, that's going to be some great experience to share with everyone. Uh, uh, Casey, uh, tell us about you and Prometheum. Yeah, uh, thank you. So I'm Casey Law, the founder of Prometheum. Um, we got started because I realized that most organizations struggle with data analytics in general. Um, before you even get to a data product, there was just a lot of difficulty in finding the data, you know, in knowing what data to use. Uh, in knowing what data to move over and assembling the data. And so we were kind of very passionate about kind of solving that problem in terms of, you know, no one really wanted to make it easy. There were, there were a lot of solutions out, out there. You have ETL tools, ingestion tools, uh, catalogs, data prep tools, but they were all siloed and they were all built for like a very sophisticated user. And, you know, before Gen AI came along, we kind of realized that pretty soon the world's going to have a lot more business users demanding access to data and there's going to be not enough power users, right? Or data engineers to be able to put them together. So we realized very early on that the automation and simplicity of, you know, building uh, what you need for analytics, you know, call it data sets, qu queries or data products, what have you do, um, really needed to kind of be looked at in a different way. And so we kind of took a, a, a different approach, which was really more of a question centric approach rather than a data centric approach, right? Everyone kind of moves everything over and then starts filtering through, what do I have? Well, why not start with the question directly what you want to know? And then from there, right, be intelligent enough to just pick what you want and using AI to assemble that. I think when we realized that the only way to solve this challenge was to have a universal way where regardless of skill set, people can arrive at the same out outcome and the same data product. And so that's where we pioneered and uh, patented um, a natural language-based approach uh, to building data products. And it, it made sense because we had already solved a lot of the infrastructure issues with our data fabric around uh, global discovery, access control, connectivity, and, and, and also virtual data access so you don't have to move and copy everything over. So that gave us a, a platform, almost like a data product creation factory, if you will, that makes it the same uniform, consistent way to automatically generate data products, um, either by UI, code, or natural language. And so that's what we've been up to uh, for the last couple of years. We recently got awarded the Cool Vendor Award from Gartner uh, for being you know, the data wow. that that's really changes uh, data management. Thank you. Thank you. So pretty excited about that. And, you know, this is a, obviously a topic near and dear to my heart, uh, because this is where everyone's talking about right now. We're, we'll love to kind of get into it with these, uh, you know, the five folks and talk about kind of the different approaches. Great. Great. Well, bringing out the hits, let's, uh, start with you, Sherrod. You, you've seen a lot of the situations with your, your time at click and before that, and then uh, also at Accenture. What is it that make? Oh, you're welcome back there in the visual there, Casey. Um, uh, Shrad, what what is it that makes a great data product, a hit data product, a lasting data product, something that someone is going to want and continue to use and use them open? And, and what kinds of attributes and cap, uh, did you, have you found that really uh, make something special? Yeah, yeah, good questions. A few things I would say. So first and foremost, in my mind, what they 
makes a data particle hit is it has to be of value for consumption. It has to be usable within a use case and not just for one project across projects. So that's the whole definition of a product, right? The product does not build for only one thing, it's, it has broad appeal. So that's first, that people are using it, people are consuming it, they're using it to solve a real business problem and they're able to get to outcomes quicker because they can use the data product as opposed to trying to do stuff on those. So that to me is the first and foremost use. The second thing is it has to be easily consumable because the biggest challenge today is data sitting in lakes and warehouses. If I'm a business user for an outcome, I gotta do a lot of work, right? Data sitting in, yeah, I can access in SQL, but what if I want to write an application and use REST API against it? It's not available in the form. I want event, I want file, I got to do a lot of work. So it has to be easy to consume for a variety of personas, whether I'm a BI developer, Gen AI developer, application developer, machine learning specialist, so different ways of consuming the data product. The third, which is I think even more important, it has to be trusted, right? So unless I have trust in the data or the data product I'm consuming, Anything that built on top of it is not going to be trusted. It's not going to be reliable at all. So I mean, trust in the data, meaning I should be able to say it's of good quality. Right? That's simple. I want to understand the lineage. Where did this data product come from? I'm looking at the claims data product, where was the data originated from? Did it come from the source system that I actually trust? So I can trust this provenance, how it came about. Can I trust it that it's protecting the privacy of the data? So, it's, it, so if I build an algorithm on top of it, I'm not leaking some of the sensitive information in the data set. So that all goes towards really trustworthiness of the, of, of the data, make sure it has a service level objective. So if, if somebody's saying this data is going to be fresh to every minute, that constantly is delivering that when I use it in my process, all that in my mind goes towards trust, the accuracy, the completeness of the data, the timeliness of the data. The other part of it is, I call it, it should be easy to find, right? <laughs> As we start creating data products, and Casey started saying this earlier, in enterprises, we also this finding data is hard. So first and foremost, data products should be easy to find. I should be able to find them, understand them, learn how to use them, request access to them before I can get to the consumption part. And the last one I would say is probably data products should be standardized so they're interoperable. Because most of the time, I'll be needing probably one or more data products to solve my business problem. So if these data products don't work together, they're totally different, there's no standardization around them, it's going to be very hard and the onus is going to be on me. So I would say probably those are four or five things I see as absolutely critical to have data products which are true hits. That's a great list. Um, and the last one gets me thinking about the Lego concept. Uh, so Mike... Uh, why don't you uh, tell me, based on your experiences, uh, what kinds of things make up uh, your list of the hit data product? Well, I, I would agree with Sherrod. I think you know, I think he's he's got uh, most of those on that list pretty well um, enumerated. I, I think I would put trust at the top, and and there's a several components. If people don't trust it, they won't use it. Mm -hmm. and ultimately, why do we build things if they're not being used? So the idea of Legos is that we are interoperable and we know that we can build a solution from these components that we're putting out there um, in front of our users. Um, I don't know if there's a toy more adopted in the world than Lego. My son happens to work for them. Um, he loves them so much. So this concept, when he was young, he would build um, visuals for me out of Legos because I've always had this, I come from a software engineering background, so we've always had this concept of, you know, you should be building classes things that you can integrate together and uh, uh, objects that can be consumed. Polymorphism is the term that's not used anymore, but I think it's very appropriate in the data industry. And when you talk about a trusted object that's validated, that has high quality, that can be used in multiple places, um, polymorphism comes into play. A, a thing that can, can be multiple, uh, take multiple forms. So if you have a customer mention, then you should have a clean list of customers, but not everybody should see that whole list of customers, right? So it's a context sensitive object. And that when someone asks for a list of customers, if they are the customer, they probably should see one row. But if they are the North America sales manager, they should probably see all the customers in North America. And maybe one side of your organization should see financial data and maybe the other side doesn't have any business seeing that. So this is, this is how you create a polymorphic data set, a Lego 
so to speak, a component that can be interoperable. I like the, I like the word you use that we often talk about these components, but they have to be uh, multi-use and they have to be able to work together to build an ultimate solution. So, so trust, uh, multi-use, and then um, I would add nimble. Um, we used to use the word agile. It's kind of been overused. It kind of means the same thing, but the ability to build them iteratively and react when the business changes to be able to make those changes. Uh, one of the things we do at Infovia is we try to put the management in the hands of the business. And oftentimes these are technical people. So they need, they need an interface for access control. They need an interface for the business rules, the calculations where they don't have to know how to write high performing SQL or, or machine learning models, but they have to be able to plug in calculations that apply and mappings that say someone in, for example, finance might define revenue differently than a person in sales. Sales wants credit as soon as the deal's signed, but finance doesn't take credit until the check's cashed, right? So those types of rules, I believe the key there is making it nimble for the business to own that and put a tool in their hands so that they can actually manage rules like access control and transformations. Thanks, Mike. Casey, it seems like you kind of come at it from that side, that user side, um, as, um, as a primary orientation. So, um, you know, you could certainly va revalidate the list from Mike and Sherrod, but maybe you could drill more, more into this kind of consumer in. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind. Right. I, I mean, I, I think, I think both gentlemen, um, nailed it in terms of kind of the, the must have kind of, you know, table stakes requirements, right? I don't think there's any disagreement there. I think, um, the approach that we take at Prometheum is, is the you know, little, little bit on top of that. Yes. You need to have all those things, but I think just because you have all those things, um, it makes it a good data product. Does it make it a hit data product? That, that's the, that's the question, right? And we're talking about hits. Um, and for us, one of the things that we learned, um, in terms of, you know, if you define a hit as something that people really want and people consume, uh, quite often, um, it comes down to kind of simplicity, right? I think, uh, it is really important, especially if you're dealing with customers that who are, you know, business users, non-technical folks. So one of the things that's very important, I believe is context. So when I see a data product, when I find a data product, yes, it needs to be searchable, discoverable, shareable, all that good stuff. But when I finally see it, will I understand what this is for? And will I understand it quickly? Or do I need a decoder ring, right? Do I, AKA, right? A couple of subject matter experts and data engineers to sit next to me and explain it to me. So I think that, you know, having business context, having enough information, metadata, where the data came from, what has it been used for, who created it, who's using it, how popular it is. These are certain things that I think instantly kind of give some shape and color to the data product. And so human beings are very good at digesting multiple inputs at the same time to kind of form like a decision, like on good or bad, like we're really good at that, right? Um, and so when you have the ability for someone to very quickly go, oh yes, it has these six things I'm looking for, Right, going back to uh, what what uh, Mike was talking about, trust, right? That instantly puts you into the can I trust, can I not trust category, right? And then I think that the second part is, while it's true we need all those things, I think a lot of organizations struggle with um, the speed at which the data product can be built and delivered uh, mm -hmm. or consumed, and that actually matters, right? Because in today's world. Sometimes you can't wait three months to make a decision. Sometimes you just can't wait to four weeks to get the data. And so, you know, as, as an exact, I'm, you know, I'm sure you guys see it as well. I would rather have data that's 70 to 80% accurate in three minutes, right? The data that's 100% accurate, but it took three months. So there is an element of, can these data products actually can be built quickly and can they be consumed easily? Because to me, that simplicity and that speed is going to drive much higher adoption, much higher demand. And if we're talking about hits, it's only a hit if you have a lot of subscribers, right? Mm -hmm. So 
those are kind of the two things that I would add on top and say, yes, those are definitely fundamentals that, you know, Mike and Shraw talked about. But if you add these two, you know, in our experience, that's how you really get a hit data product. And and those are sort of things that Prometheum has really invested in, in making sure they come out. Um, and the third part um, is, you know, this notion of data contracts, right? I think if you're talking about data product, one of the things I think, um, you know, Shraw, you mentioned earlier is like, you got to know, you know, who is it being built for, right? And I think that's very important. And to kind of elaborate on that, a data contract starts with a person who wants to consume the product, right? So you know exactly who it's being built for. And they, the consumer gets to tell you what it is that they want. And they get to specify that. And the reason why that's important is it, it prevents you from building something that nobody wants, prevents you from building something that nobody needs uh, or is just inaccurate. And a lot of times we see data teams and business teams going back and forth, struggling with that. And so a data contract is a great way to get people on the same page, especially if you can actually enforce the data contract digitally, right? Not a manual uh, method, but once I've defined, for example, this is what I need, and these are the performance characteristics, for example, imagine being able to instantly look at a data product and know, hey, this meets three out of the five things that we specified our contract or this data product actually meets all five of the things we've specified. Again, going back to quality and trust, right? That instantly gives you a higher level of trust knowing that it was built to spec. So that's the kind of the, the two things I would add on top of that. Great. And with uh, you can you inject something in there? I think, I think you're getting at transparency in some way. That's yeah. a topic we have. That's a, a word we haven't used yet, but, but people won't trust things until they're, until they understand where they came from yeah and so that transparency of the 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 lineage transforms and the control and the like where did it come from how it was built yeah who built it what it's right. for exactly all those who things it? yeah and what and yeah i would agree you got it that's that's great and it seems like there's a a tie i, I like the who aspect the human part we sometimes forget about that in technology but like it, uh, using Mike's example, if this data set is, was built and used by the, you know, head of financial reporting, I got one point of view on that data set right there in terms of its uh, lineage and, and authenticity and integrity versus, you know, this is the, um, you know, so, so, so it was thrown together by the, you know, the AI modeling team, you know, you just got a sense that, hey, there's, they're, they're, they're still work, you know, it's kind of probably in process. All right, so great on who, um, and um, maybe uh, maybe that gives me a, a chance to maybe switch the order a little bit. Let's talk about the who's inside the the band. You know, the what are what are some of the most important roles and responsibilities? Of course, we need a great drummer. I mean, but but beyond a drummer and a, and a fabulous lead singer, um, Shrod, what do you what do you think? You know, you uh, you. From Accenture, you you help people's time, you know. So who was in that? Who was in that band? Who did you want in the client's band in order to be to be a complete? Yeah, yeah. So so two things. So so first, I think band is a good analogy because data products. The, the biggest thing for me that data products bring is they bring ownership and accountability to data, which is missing today. So I've been in so many meetings with customers and I've asked them, this piece of data, who owns it? So either no hand stands up because everybody is responsible for a little poor. Nobody says, oh, I own this data. Or somebody in technology, IT, some engineer, data engineer will stand up, I own, which is not ownership, right? So, so that's the biggest thing. So, so the, the ownership means there has to be a team, a band responsible for this data product. And that could have built multiple types of roles in them, right? Early days when you're building data products, your fabric may not have full self self capability. You may have a data engineer as part of data product who's responsible for maybe moving the data, writing some code to stitch it together. And as your fabric matures, gets more self serve. To Michael's point earlier, you could have a business person simply expressing in a natural language. So we're doing it clicky, we're providing a natural language interface so you can define your transformation you want to do on the data in natural language and convert it to code. But initially, early days, depending upon the maturity of stuff, not everything can be done that way. You're trying to pull data out of mainframe 
to pull it. I mean, that's not going to be a natural language interface. You got to need to write some code. So data engineers could be part of your band. Data architects could be part of your band. But the, in the end, when you bring this data, you got to put it into some model form, right? Depending upon to Casey's point, you need to know who's consuming it for what purpose. So you need to figure out what's the best way to shape the data. So always a model behind it. So you could have a data architect as part of your team. You definitely will have a business person as part of the team. Very critical would understand what the data is, put it in the business context. Again, Casey said the right thing. You need to define the business semantics out of what is it you're looking for, definitions, glossary, definition in business terms, how to consume it. So the business person has to be part of the team. You may have some analytics embedded with it. You could even have a data scientist as part of the team. But the most important person is, in my mind, what's, when you look at a kind of orchestra, like if I look at the conductor, right? So I call it a data product owner. In the end, and I sometimes call it, it's almost look at it as a CEO of the company. So if you look at Casey or look at Mike, they're CEOs of the company. They have ultimate accountability and responsibility. It doesn't mean they do everything. So same thing is a data product owner. is like a champion on the team, conductor, the CEO of the data product. They have ultimate responsibility, but they work as a team. All these different roles that are described are all part of the team. You could have a data ops person part of the team because in the end you're going to deploy the data product. Where does it live? Where does it run? There's a data set, there's infrastructure, there's compute behind you, versioning behind Michael said iteration. So when you create a new version of data product, you're going to deploy the next version. So all those things, so you could have a data ops person as part. So all those roles come together with the champion, which I call a data product owner or a data product manager who has ultimate accountability for it. Want more Insight Jam? Follow us on Instagram for exclusive content like a daily dose of best practices and buying advice from industry experts and leading solution providers. Or subscribe to our YouTube channel for long-form highlights from our expert panel discussions. And if you prefer to listen, please rate and review the Insight Jam podcast on Apple, Spotify, or Google. The solutions review team is hard at work collecting the best enterprise technology information from around the globe, so don't miss out. Now, let's get back to the show. Uh, Casey, uh, I'm just switch the order around just for variety here. Um, you kind of talked about come a lot about the the, the user side and and some mm -hmm. of their point of view. Maybe you can build on that business person and uh, data product owner aspect. Is there something? Yep, uh, some. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, yeah, I think Shrad definitely brought up a good point. The data product owner uh, ultimately you need someone to be fully accountable, right? I mean we. When we're building, you know, software or SaaS products to have you, there's, you know, the product manager is the person ultimately accountable, right? And if you're treating data as a product, right, um, and the philosophy that data products are going to be built in a way that is consistent, uniform, predictable, <laughs> uh, you need someone that went through to choke, right? And so I think that data product owner is certainly very important. That person... You know, depending on the data product, right? It could be a data analyst, it could be a data engineer, um, person who knows how it's actually constructed, right? And why it was constructed the way it was. So I think that's that's important. I think the subject matter expert is also important, right? Oftentimes we get too caught up with the technical aspect of how the data is built. But um, like when I was an analyst, for example, um, you know, I would look, I would know, I can look at the numbers, I would know this is wrong. I don't care how you did it, but I just know it's wrong, right? Because I know we didn't sell this many widgets. And when the report came back, so we sold this many widgets. I'm like, dude, it's wrong. Like, don't even argue about, like, you know, why you think the transformation and the pipelines were correct. It's wrong. So you need someone with that business context, right? That subject matter expert. Um, and, you know, going back to your bad analogy, right? You need someone who's going to take that song and deliver it and perform it, right? And that's, you know, call it what you want, storytelling, uh, et cetera. You need someone like business owner, a business analyst, for example, that can take that data and says, I can now answer the question that people have with this product. Because ultimately, that's why we do it. It's to answer questions, right? And gain insights. And so it's not enough that someone knows how to build it. It's not enough someone can look at it and say, yeah, it's right or wrong. You need someone to be able to say, I can, I know how to use this. I can play this song. I can sing this song in the way that it was meant to be delivered, right? And so I think that's a very important aspect of someone more on, like, a, like again, like a business analyst or maybe an executive who has enough overview uh, and context to be able to see that and be able to say, yes, this is how we do it. So 
if I was assembling that band, right, I definitely would have my, the guy to take care of, you know, how things are built, right? The data engineer, data analyst, someone that's going to be the data product owner. It could be one of them. It could be someone else. We, in the organizations now, we actually do see some people who are actually the data product owner. They're not building, but they're ultimately accountable, just like a product manager would be, right? And then the subject matter experts, um, and, and then the business analyst, the person who is going to deliver the song. One thing that's starting to pop up that's actually really interesting, I've started to see now in a few cases, is a data experience team. Hmm. So, yeah, this team is actually now getting involved, and they're very, very closely tied with data products. It's not enough that you have secure data products. You've got robust data products. You have data products that have the adequate business context. These guys are focused on making sure people have a great experience, right? Asking, producing, finding, and consuming data products. Um, and that's kind of interesting. That's kind of like someone is going to make sure when you go to that Rolling Stones concert that, you know, Rob, Robert and his wife is going to have a fantastic time. Um, and I think that's actually a super important ex experience, super important role. So uh, I would love to have a data experience rock star uh, on my team for sure. Wow. That's that's uh, really taking the analogy far and great job. Uh, <laughs> Mike, uh, who's in your band? So so this is a great segue because that that concept of a, of a, of a data experience person, I would think of them in the music industry as your promoter. Mm-hmm. And um, just uh, 10 days ago, I was at a music, um, almost like a Woodstock feel. I was literally out in the field and a bunch of people with guitars and they would come up and play their songs. And uh, a colleague of mine in the data industry, his wife is a recording artist. And we were sitting there talking with each other about the, the minor amount of difference between the talent of those performing those songs. But but the but those who make millions versus those who starve, the difference is the promoter. Did those songs get on the radio? And did somebody in high school have an experience with that song that makes them stand up and cheer when it comes on the radio or when somebody plays it in front? Because all these people were per, per, were parading their their original works that they had poured their heart and souls in and meant a ton to them because they came out of pain or, or joy, but, but none of the rest of us could connect with them. And so we sat there and listened and nodded our head and tapped our foot. But when somebody came on and played, you know, journey, don't stop believing a whole crowd stands up and starts clapping their hands because we've had an experience with that song. And so I think you're right on there. Casey is that, is that getting this in front of the right people to have an experience so that they will tell their friends and enjoy it together, enjoy these data products together. Wow. That now, getting it now that the art of making that happen is, yeah. is hard, right? That's the whole marketing component. It's, it's, it's very hard. And, and I actually think the, a, a good data experience team, they need to come from either one of the, the production team, right? Either former data engineers or former data product or something, because that's what gives them credibility, right? For them to say, hey guys, we need you to do X, Y, Z to ensure this is going to be a great experience. So it's not enough to just have the team, right? That it'd be even better if that promoter, right? Has actually done the job before, right? Like me, like in boxing, Oscar De La Hoya, you know, he's a promoter now, but he was a boxer. He knew what it was like to be a boxer. And so he can connect with the people who are actually, you know, boxers now. So something to take, to keep in mind, some of the more successful data experience teams that I've seen, they can ensure experience because they know what they're talking about. They know what bad experience is. They've experienced it. They know what a great experience is. They know if we play journey, people are going to get off their seats. And so they're able to credibly convince the data teams to be able to build those type of data products. And Casey, to add to that, I think part of the problem I see in the data world is that people don't market the success very well. So I think to your nice. point, like I think nice. if I were data <laughs> when I see the five teams using it, the generating outcomes, let's go ahead and so the person, like to your point, I like the uh, experience that their responsibility is to market. Look, the, the, these five teams have used their data product. This is what the outcome they derive. They saved X amount of time, this outcomes. Yeah. So now 
now there's excitement there. Oh, people are using you. Everybody wants to see others are using it, getting value from it. I get excited. I like the analogy of an experienced person. Part of their job becomes marketing the success that the data product is driving in the organization. Yeah, and, yeah. and this drive, it's a very good point because um, when people think about data marketplaces, for example, right, people oftentimes only think about the sharing of the data or the finding of the data. But I think a key part of a data marketplace is actually, you know, <laughs> for lack of a better term, the promotion, right? Yeah. Uh, let's promote successful outcomes. Let's promote mm -hmm. successful data products that people got. Because the first thing you walk in and I see, wow, there's a special on this, right? Or wow, this is a five-star review product by 30,000 people. Like that gives me a, a, an interest. I'm like, hey, I want, why was this so successful? I better take a look at it. Um, so I think to your point, that's a very key element. And I think if you're thinking about data products and, and the kind of the, the band that you're putting together, think about the promoter, but think about the stage or the vehicle in which you can have that promotion, right? So if it's a marketplace, make sure you've got the promotion capability on your marketplace. And that, that could just, some of it could just be facts. Like this data set, this data product is used by these 26 people. That's pretty good. As well, yeah. you know, and you have five reviews that are five-star reviews. Even just that, just that simple gives me, wow, wow, this is, this is, yes. and I should, I, I'm going to invest a little time to understand more. Um, For sure. It seems like we're talking about a lot of capabilities, and but that, you know, so the, let's go back now. Let's talk about the instruments. Let's talk about that stage. Let's before, talk. About before we go there, can I interject one thing? Because Casey said something that I think is really, really important here. He alluded to it, but we haven't dived into it. So if I could just make one point. The urgency of delivering good enough data sometimes is more important than delivering qual highest the highest quality data. So as an executive, if I'm making a decision and I have nothing, I would rather have 40 to 60% accurate data than zero. But if somebody's out there building something that needs to be perfect before they start getting adoption, then it doesn't help me. So I think we often lose sight as, you know, as professionals as engineers, we want to build perfection, but as, uh, as conductors, you know, we want to deliver a, a, a perfect symphony, right? But I think there's a lot to be said for putting your thoughts on paper and writing a little song that you sang to your friend and start getting the CEO to adopt that quickly and see value out of it. You can iterate and improve it later. Yep. And so that's now a segue back to your how do we how do we how do we create the tools and the environment so that we can deliver quickly and then iteratively improve? Yeah, and 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 just building on that before we go into detail, but again, just in the comments and and and, the, and some of the descriptive elements. Hey, this is a quick and dear, dirty data set that we put together for this one-time analysis and use it at your own risk. Right. Yep. Yeah, that, that'd be great. I actually, like, and, and Bob, I think the key thing in my mind, I to Mike is transparency and you mentioned this earlier it's okay to do that but make sure people consuming it know the last mm -hmm. thing i would want is somebody takes this rough data and starts using their compliance reporting right <laughs> so, so i think the key part is a transparency yes so, so I've, I've made this data available so quick quick okay i'm making this available to you in near real time but i haven't performed quality checks on right right okay that's a great way so if i want to consume data which is fresh most up to date but I'm less concerned about the quality. For my use case, it's perfect to start trying out. I don't want to start using it. So I think it's great to do that as long as we're able to, through that marketplace, whatever vehicle you put together, be able to show people what it is, what kind of contracts, service level objectives, yep. contracts this adheres to. Right. Yep. Yeah. It can be context. Should metric should include that, that idea of what is our confidence in this data set? And if it's new, not and not heavily used, even if it's the CEO using it, if it's new and not heavily used, it's got a little quality rating or a little confidence rating rather. But as it gains adoption and it matures, that confidence rating goes up. So, so let's talk about the technology, the capabilities that really need to underlie and enable this. Um, 
we have some some traditional, you know, it's all the old school, put it all in a warehouse. I mean, there, we've talked a little bit about a marketplace or a catalog or a platform. We've talked a little bit about maybe starting to use some AI inside to enable some of these processes, et cetera. Uh, Sharad, why don't you talk a bit about what do you think some of the key elements, you know, the instruments, you know, the stage of the sound system, what, what's, what are the, ele- the technology elements for these data products that you'd say is a must have, must have. Yeah. So, so, so I look at it in three different planes, right? So the first plane, bottommost, I call it the foundational plane. So think of that as kind of your fabric layer. You need core capabilities to get data out of system, you, uh, different ways of integrating. So you may move data, ETL, ELT, or you may virtualize the data. But in the end, you got to, if I'm building a data product, I need to be able to tap into data, integrate it, join it, model it. And that foundation layer also has core capabilities to be able to do quality check on it, be able to detect PII. So that to me are foundational capabilities in kind of like a fabric type layer. Mm -hmm. Second layer on top of that, I see, I call it a data product management plane. So this is a net new plane. So I click, for example, in a product, we build a brand new plane for this in addition to the foundational plane where data product teams come in and they're going to start constructing their data products. I think like a workbench. So they'll select what data sets, add business semantic, define the business rules, quality rule, define the policies around it, define the contracts, the service level objective, define how they want to expose the data, maybe define in natural language how they want to transform the data. And ultimately, this is the place where they manage the life cycle of the data product. They'll activate it. They'll monitor who's using it, how they're using it for They'll create at some point a new version of it. And at some point, if it's not used, maybe retire it, right? So that whole plane specifically designed for the data product management team. And this is a net new capability we're building because it doesn't really exist. I've seen customers build their own. And then the third plane. Hang on, just a quick second. Yeah. So it's almost here. You just described a managing a life cycle. Yeah. So, so, so you have to manage. The, earlier, everybody said that, right? Data products are life cycle. You start small version one, small thing, and you add new stuff, add more data sets, add more quality rules, add more interfaces. It's a living, breathing thing. So you need a workbench, a place where you create new versions of it, deploy them, track them, monitor them, observe them, right? Things like that. And the third well, thing- And retire them. The, the bad yeah, ones should be retired, right? Yeah, if nobody's using that, let's retire them. Why are we consuming resources and build this pipeline? And the third plane is is the most important plane is the data Marketplace, plane, data product marketplace. This is where once I activate, data products show up there. That's where they're marketing. People come and search and find them. They understand them. They look at what they mean. Look at the lineage. Look at the quality. What are the people are saying? I can comment. I can give my feedback. I can make enhancement requests. So this request access to the data products, all that thing I call it. The, so, so for example, at Click, we are building capabilities in all three layers. And in my mind, all three layers of these capabilities are required really truly build and manage the data products in an enterprise. So you need tooling at the, all, across all these three layers. I like that segregation, especially towards the point of the experience. And you could focus creating a great experience on that third data yeah. product marketplace layer. And, and, that's, um, and it's interesting how in the past, I think a lot of the a lot of that work could all get done, but it'd be mixed and matched in different. Exactly. You know, so, 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 so to Casey's point, you can separately focus on making that experience fantastic, even though initially your data product management team could be a little more hands dirty, cobbling things together, but you could still make your data product look fantastic and appealing with documentation and schemas and stuff like that. Now, initially could have cobbled together. But as more and more capabilities get built in, the job of the data product management team gets easier and easier as you build more capability in that middle middle layer and the foundational fabric layer. We won't say fake it till you make it. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, uh, what 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 do you think some of the key elements of the technology are is that the, with as enablers? I, I'm going to do something I, I probably wouldn't normally do. I'm going to jump into tech you know, down in the technical details a little bit. Um, and uh, somebody used the word earlier, predictable. And I think, I think it was UKC, but 
um, to to build a, a product that's predictable, um, which is going to eventually be trusted, uh, we have to have certain standards around how that how that's done. And so we need an architect on the team to build those standards. But our architect can't run around policing everybody's work. We need tools to make it easy for our band to create predictable outputs. Kind of like a recording studio, a microphone and a and a good old fashioned re, you know recorder. So, I believe that the, the synonym for that in the in our industry is uh, templates. We need templates for the components, the Legos, if you will, that build our data pipelines. Because really, if we're honest with ourselves, we're all sitting here with shirts that try to sell different products. But if we're honest with ourselves. By the way, did you notice I, I changed mine because I, I saw you know, that. made me kind of that. feel kind of inadequate. You know, I was like, God, man, these guys came on with like vendor swag. Here I am. My, like, yeah, <laughs> I saw that shirt. All right. That's cool. I'm, we're gonna, gonna, play, I'm gonna rock it, man. All right, cool. We're all here to, you know, to, to, to sell, you know, we're all here as leaders of our companies here to sell a, a better mousetrap. But in reality, the idea of moving data from one place to another and transforming it and documenting it, none of that is novel. All of those problems have been solved before. So putting templates around each of the components, am I extracting from Oracle or an API? Am I depositing it on Snowflake or on a old, good old-fashioned on-prem SQL server? If there, there's components for each of those with templates around them, and I believe a metadata-driven system where you where your mappings and your transforms are captured in metadata and then applied to templates to generate your pipelines is the answer to building not only good data products, but building them quickly and consistently. And Ideally, even putting them in the hands of the business because now they don't have to be super coders to build a data pipeline. And I think all these products do that, you know, in, in one way or another. But I think that's the key is enabling your team to play their guitar and their drums in a, in a fashion that, that choreograph together. Mm -hmm. And I think data driven, templatized code generation is the, is is the you know is the future i mean it, it's happening now but it's the direction we're going it's it, what it isn't what it's not is chat gpt generated code for our objects right we we don't really need code slingers anymore what we need are people that can architect the components together and build a product out of components that have been proven already and you get better data quality out of that process on top of it and implied, say, machines tend to not. And implied in what you said, the templates, you talked a lot about the pipelines to get it there, but at the end, you really mentioned also the, the results that should be in templates. Because, hey, I need standardized REST APIs for these. I also need, you know, a um, uh, nice SQL. Yeah, I'm sure templates. Yeah. yeah. So all the way through the templates can, from start to finish. Well, that's true whether you're building an API for access, whether you're allowing SQL access, whether you're just delivering data sets, um, you know, to an application. All of those require that level of consistency in order for their adoption to be easy. I think you said it in your opening remarks, Prasad. It's got to be easy to to use, to utilize, to integrate. Yeah. And then, Michael, one comment I would make is, so I take the templates as a great idea. I take the templates even one step forward. So actually, so when I was at Mosaic working with some, we can start to build industry and domain specific templates on top of it. So, so let's say I go in healthcare, right? They are very standard things, members, claims, different type of data products, and they could be templatized, right? By us as vendors or by other consulting companies or companies who are in different domains, be able to build templates. That's my vision, right? As we build this platform, our partners will come and build industry and domain specific templates on top of them, which when they take it to the customer are quickly configured. So even right now with all the tools you could have, I go build a data product, may still be, I got to 
push a lot of buttons and stuff, but if that also could be templatized 60, 70%. So, so I agree with Michael, there's templates on terms of actual building the data product, but there are also templates higher level, which could be industry and domain specific to further accelerate. You're right. There's, there's a right way and a wrong way to automate things. Yeah. Um, you can build a lot of junk fast yeah. if, if, with today's tools, but I, I would agree with you having some structure around both the industry. I would, I would, I would say that's synonymous with the data model, right? Mm -hmm. What, what you have industry specific data models, yeah, and then you have tech components because yeah. even every industry is going to have their own technology yeah. sources under the hood exactly. and different targets want to produce yeah. that on. Yep. Yeah. Well, well guys, guys, we're at about nine minutes here before we to, to finish this out. Um, it seems we've covered a lot of ground. It's, it's like the band greatest hits analogy definitely worked uh, as a, as a, as a lens on, on this, this challenge and this opportunity around data products. Um, it, maybe just one each um, uh, piece of advice, best practice, something you guys have learned uh, from your customers and your experiences as uh, maybe a starting point or a best practice that you, you, would, you would advise people um, um, beyond, you know, by click, you know, uh, is, is foundation. Um, you know, something a little beyond that, but um, a, a little more would, be a piece of practical advice that you'd have for folks. So, Sharad, what? Yeah, that's, that makes sense. Um, yeah. So, I I always, yeah. So, I always tell my customers, start small. I don't try to boil the, because a lot of people I talk to, because they get too caught up in you know, data product and they talk about mesh. It's like, so sure, do I need to reorganize around that, break my organization? I said, no, no, stop. Let's start small. Pick a domain, pick a data product, right? And again, your team, that the band we talked about, doesn't mean you got to reorganize and move people around. It could be a team. You select set of people and form a team to get going. An initial could be, I tell them, a good place to start could be what I call source-oriented data products. You have an SAP, you have a Workday, right? From there, a lot of people look into consumer. Create those probably because you could have team. So basically, I think it starts small. And I think both Michael and Casey said that earlier. Think of data products as an iterative process. Don't think you'll solve 100 problems. Start with, can you solve one problem? So start with, it could be a data set with a simple, start with a SQL interface. But I think some fundamental things you should always adhere to, right? There should be somebody who owns that data product, right? There should be some type of contract on that. People should be able to find them. So some basic constructs should be there. But your data product could start simple, simple data sets, couple of rules, one single way of consuming it, right? Some metadata around it and learn and, 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 and grow from this. So that's my biggest advice I tell customers is start small. And that's come from my consulting days. How do you make it real, right? You boil the ocean, eight, nine month project is never gonna happen. Great. Uh, that's, that's fabulous. Uh, uh, Casey, um, what would your uh, piece of advice be? Well, I mean, I, I go back to the experience because I think ultimately, um, as human beings, we're motivated by an emotional reaction uh, that allows us to say, "This, let's go continue this project, let's expand it, let's get more resources. So part of the experience, I think, uh, that we didn't talk about yet, but I think we all take for granted is there's a lot of work that needs to be done with the infrastructure and the plumbing. And I think when people start thinking about data product, they, there's an assumption that that will still be messy. That'll get done. We're going to pipeline everything over. We're going to move. But guys, if you get bogged down on the infrastructure piece, you know, things like pipelines breaking, things like SQL incompatibility and that type of stuff, things like poor data quality, it will significantly derail any project you have around your data product. So this is where I think, you know, thinking about kind of a modern architecture, like a data fabric, for example, where you don't have to move everything over, right? You don't have to centralize on one platform or one SQL interface. Give yourself that flexibility saying, I'm gonna keep what I have, but with a fabric, my teams don't have to worry about the plumbing. It's metadata driven, they can search what they have, but they can build it virtually first without consuming any resources and then verify once you know it's good, then you can materialize it, right? And so. That goes a long way because you're saving costs, you're saving time, and you're 
eliminating complexity. I would not underestimate those three things because you can have the best data product in the world. And like we talked about earlier, if it takes you nine months to get there, no one's going to care. You're never going to get the funding and the support to do the next data product, right? So remove some of these infrastructure obstacles from you as quickly as you can. Um, and that's why I think the data fabric architecture has gotten very, very popular uh, in recent years because people see that as a way to enable, right? Get that out of the way so that you can enable the building of the data products. Okay, Mike, you, thank you, Casey. Mike, you got a one minute answer? I'm first and foremost an architect. So, so I'm gonna say that we don't have time, you don't have time to solve all the problems yourself. So obviously we're here selling software, but we all, um, I, I represent a services organization as well. And we believe, we call ourselves data guides in the great data adventure because organizations don't have time to make all these mistakes themselves. They, they have to make a decision on a technology and a methodology and then build something. And I think you're right on Prasad, start small um, and, uh, and, and then iterate, learn, iterate, put components together. And you don't have time to do that all. I'm climbing the 14ers in Colorado. I'm gonna bring somebody along that's been there before. So I think bring a guide with you so you don't have to make all the mistakes yourself. Great. That's, that's real good pragmatic advice. Get some help um, and learn, learn from an expert. Do what Mick does. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, this has been fabulous, guys. Um, I'm sure this is just the start of these conversations. Sherrod, if people wanted to track you down, do you have a, 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 how, how, should, how could they contact you? Well, best to LinkedIn or LinkedIn, right? That's the best way to connect with me. Okay, and then of course they can go to click.com. Yeah, this is click.com, everything is there, yeah. Uh, Casey? Yeah, uh, LinkedIn as well, um, or Promethium.ai, right? www.promethium.ai, you'll find uh, everything about us and you can reach out and uh, book a time with me as well. Great, Mike. Infovia.com, I-N-F-O-V-I-A, and our product is InfoSecure with no E. But you can track me down on LinkedIn. I go by Michael there, but all my friends call me Mike. Great. Well, we feel like you're you're a friend of ours now. So, so Mike, thank you for that. Um, great job, everyone. Uh, I feel like a rock and roller, and I hope uh, everyone else here in this uh, in the audience today has that same same energy and same vibe. I, I think we really um, had, had a fabulous conversation. So, uh, rock on. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye -bye. guys. Thank you. It was an honor. Solutions Review is inviting you to join InsightJam.com. What started a few years ago as a social media event to celebrate enterprise technology has now grown into an always-on tech community with live events, discussions, videos, vendor showcases, and industry resources. Our vetted roster of experts, thought leaders, and analysts are sharing tips and tricks daily. So if you're interested in getting involved, join the long list of companies and brands who have already participated by visiting InsightJam.com today.